So this is a different kind of talk because one, this is an area of uh, great interest, I think, to a lot of organizations. Ever since we got SDN and NFE started way back, it's been nine, eight, nine years now. And what I want to talk about today is a follow-on to a, uh, a talk that I actually gave in uh, an event in March of this year that, got a, uh, that, that had a really interesting response and a lot of interesting feedback to me, and it sort of motivated me to, to sort of think about what I can do to help contribute again to the community uh, in, the, in this area of the people implications of uh, SDN and NFE and automation. Now, the, this time, and, and I, I don't know if anybody saw my talk or actually looked at the slides, I had a lot of different views and the like in, in various different social media channels. Uh, but at this time, what I, what I did is I didn't just provide my own perspective. What I did is I talked to some of the pioneers and the leaders in the open networking movement since the early days, back in the 2010, 11, 12 time frame, and, and, and up till today. And I took the results from those interviews and organized it in a way to sort of answer some really fundamental and key questions. Now, the contributors, the one disclaimer is that the contributors, and again, like our panel where Diego and Klaus were speaking as uh, individuals, uh, that that same uh, disclaimer applies to all of the people that I talked to. And there were a few people who wanted their identity uh, to be anonymous, which we certainly re respect. So first of all, I just want to review, when I talk about the open networking movement, I, I want to share what that really means. And, uh, and I think it, it, it's, it's actually unfolding in three distinct phases. The first one is the SDN phase. And this is around the 2009, 10, 11, when we first got started. The big catalyst for SDN was the Open Networking Foundation, which was uh, founded in the spring of 2011. And it stimulated not only activity in the standards bodies, but also in the open source community. And open source networking was, um, was born around that time, and it really got off the ground with a project called Open Daylight. And Open Daylight turns out to be the most, uh, uh, or, or at least one of the most widely deployed open source networking platforms that we have. And, uh, and it, was, uh, it, it was an offshoot that actually even spawned additional activity. Phase two is when we introduced uh, NFE, actually right at this conference in 2012. And I don't know if anybody was here back in 2012, actually at least one, but maybe a couple others. And there was a white paper issued and, uh, and then the rest is history. In 2013, we all went to the south of France and it snowed. And ever since then, uh, network functions virtualization and the entire virtual network virtualization movement was really, uh, it wasn't born, but it was really accelerated. And that, act that activity actually also kicked off even more open source activity, including not only a project called the Open, uh, platform for Net, or NFE, but OPNFE, but also the orchestration projects, which uh, ultimately led to, uh, to even more activity. But not only that, moving up the stack. And then finally, the automation phase has been around 2016-17 with the introduction of the projects that uh, were, were uh, the, the precursor to the open network automation platform and related activities. Uh, as well as work in the MEF and work in Etsy with uh, what Klaus has, has been sharing with the Zero Touch Service Management Group. And it's all leading up to 5G and, and beyond. Now, you might be thinking, well, there's lots of other networking projects that were uh, introduced in that time. Yes, that's absolutely true. These were selected in a, in a prescribed way because many of the people that I talked to were principals in these projects. So what is the state of uh, open networking? Well, let's look at the, mar the market perspective on this. I mean, first of all, um, again, I want to reiterate that the responses I'm providing, you notice, are all in quotes. And these quotes are coming from the contributors to this presentation. And I, I, what I was particularly interested is when multiple respondents were actually sharing similar sentiments. And I tried to highlight these in the next few slides. 
First of all, when we go back, a, a, a key question I raised was, so where are we relative to expectations? Not just where are we, but did, are we doing well? Are we doing poorly? And what many believe is that we are a little bit late, but we're only a couple of years behind where we, we might think that we, we would have been. If we look at some other examples of technology adoption, you know, we're, we're looking at inter, um, technologies that take 10 or even 20 years to unfold. And this technology really got off the ground in the carrier community in the 2012-13 timeframe. So if we look at where we are today, and which is 2019, soon to be 2020, we're seven or so years into the project. It looks like to me that we're not really that far off. And many of the respondents also felt that way. Now, what were some of the other, uh, other, other considerations in, in assessing the state of open networking? Well, one thing that came up from a couple of individuals is the aging nature of the telecommunications industry. And, and not only that, relative to the extremely young average ages in the cloud community as an example, and in some cases, maybe a half the age of, of some of the average some of the for some of the larger, some of the larger, larger more, established, more established carriers. carriers. And this has all, and sorts, this has of all sorts of implications, especially, especially though, the inability, the inability to, hire to hire new graduates, new graduates and hire and some, some of the new some skills, of the new that, skills are that are going to be required to drive open, to drive open networking, networking, networking over the long term. term. Another, Another observation, observation made by multiple, made by multiple individuals, individuals is, the, is, the, is, that, is that communication service communication providers, service providers even, today, even, even, today, with, even with even with even with literally millions, millions of dollars, of dollars and thousands, thousands, of thousands of individuals being, being trained, trained, being trained and retrained and retrained and skilled, and skilled. We, we, CSP, CSP still rely on vendors. Rely on there vendors. is a there role, is a for, role vendors for vendors in open networking today, today at least. And that's and that's going to be true in the near future because it's really not changing that dramatically. And, and, and part, and of, the part of the considerations that, that operators, operators were, facing were facing in the real, in world, the real world, thinking about, thinking about where they are, where they the, are the, 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 their ability, their ability to, change, to change, the, uh, the, uh, the need, the need for, different for different types of people, of people different types, different of, types roles, of roles, and, this, and, this, and we'll different, see types, different of types of organizations, organizations are definitely are going, definitely to, have going to have an impact on their ability, on their ability to, execute to execute on the goal, on the goal of, of what we'll what, call we'll major call transformation. transformation. And, and the, the key word here is yet, because we do expect, and, and many of the operators are on the path, but relative to expectations, they were not able to achieve very lofty and ambitious goals to actually execute on the transformation that's required. And when we, and, and one of the, the quotes that I particularly appreciated was from an individual who said, hey, look, we are making progress, but we're somewhere between the hype and the reality. And I think that's a very good way to look at the, the market and at least the market perspective on open networking. Next, if we look at some of the challenges, why didn't we actually achieve some of the goals of pushing this technology faster? Well, part of it is, is the first area, which is we are, as one person put it, married to vast infrastructure. There's just no question the installed base is a, is a tremendous asset in terms of being able to cultivate revenue and cultivate business and relationships that are going to be sustainable for, for many years, if not decades. But at the same time, it makes it particularly difficult to actually introduce large-scale technology transformation. And not to mention organizational and even business transformation. That's a whole de degree beyond that. And then secondly, there is a, again, we think about expectations. I think m many of the, or at least some of the operators, and I can't speak for all of them, but some are certainly, they underestimated the magnitude of the change necessitated for, for embarking on the digital transformation journey. And this isn't even true in the full realm of transformation, but even at the technology level. It's a huge change. It has implications not just for the kind of products and services that are deployed, but also for all the organizational impact, the people, and so forth. And another uh, interesting observation that was made that uh, about trying to rationalize 
where, you know, why didn't we achieve the goals that we had set way back in the 2012-13 time frame is that the boundary for telecommunication is evolving. I think we all are experiencing a complete revamping of the competitive landscape for a, a number of different operators and, and vendors, as well as system integrators and everyone who's in the value chain, the way they used to operate. I mean, it used to be we had very highly segmented products and, and, and in areas and in siloed organizations and so forth. And that boundary is dramatically shifting thanks to the introduction of the cloud. Now, what it's served to do though is to create an uncharted territory that when you mix that with a typically relatively risk averse organization or community like telecommunications, it makes it very, very difficult to make the, that, that change and turn the corner. And especially when you have the financial pressures of different types of models that, that vary tremendously from the models of some of the, the new market entrants over-the-top providers, public cloud providers, and a range of other providers that are also getting into the competitive space for telecommunications. It's not so surprising why we, it's, it's so difficult to achieve the goals of transformation. So next, let's look at some of the organizational considerations. I mean, first of all, uh, as one person put it, look, we're, we're off deploying 5G. How many of these large, huge initiatives can we undertake? And the answer is not many. It may be more than one, but it's certainly not, we can't, with, with all these moving parts, it's just very difficult to embark upon 5G. And at the same time, think about uh, the virtualization of, uh, of network infrastructure, virtualization of the network services. We're transforming into service-oriented organizations, into software organizations. All of this is, 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 it just puts a tremendous strain on the organizations. Another observation was massive change requ requires management buy-in, but at every level. It's not enough for those at the top to wave the flag and say, this is what we're gonna be, this is how we're gonna do it. It has to be, uh, there has to be buy-in up and down the organization. And this really goes all the way through all the way to the lowest levels of the organization. And this is not something that happens overnight. And it's not something also that there's a playbook to necessarily even relate to that you can actually leverage and bank on. And then of course, we have one more concern that is, that sets in for very large organizations who have well-established cultures, well-established workforces, well-established organizations, and that is, no one can afford to be complacent, and especially about your own job. And if you think about the, 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 the way in which the organizations for many large companies, certainly in the United States, but I think even beyond the US boundaries, it's now no longer a guarantee, there, there's really no guarantees when it, when it comes to organizational stability. Uh, the the C-suite is actually being replaced at pretty record rates, especially at the top. But even if you look even at the next levels below that, the average tenure for various people is just going down. Many people, if you look at resumes today, how many people have have... I was at one place for many, many years. Well, that's less and less the case, especially in technology. And then, of course, we have the other consideration, which is uh, the financial markets and some of the political uh, pressures of, of actually just performing and being more profitable and being more sustainable as a company, as a viable long-term enterprise is, uh, is, is very, very difficult. And it just puts tremendous burden on the organization. And you just need to, in order to, to, to effectuate the change, you really need to be able to build a business case for that change. It's not enough just to wave, you know, arm waving with high level objectives, but you really have to be much more deliberate about it. And without that history of actually being able to bank on how we might have done things in the past, it's going to be very difficult. And and what many had, many of the individuals I talked to, most of the individuals I talked to, are individuals who are not only just participating in the beginnings, the genesis of a new technology and a new architecture shift. But on top of that, these individuals 
have actually been involved in organizations that are executing on their objectives. They had to craft their own journey and they had to take the steps that they thought were best for their own organizations. So they have a lot of knowledge and a lot of, uh, a, a lot of, I would say, value to gain if we think about how we can share that and disseminate across the community. And some of the key lessons learned are, and this is what, again, multiple individuals brought up the idea that, you know, this was never about cost reduction. Cost reduction is there. It's a necessity for most network technology shifts. But this is really about agility. It was about organizational agility, business agility, the ability for operations, and certainly network agility. It was not just about, we're going to be able to, to optimize CapEx by going to, uh, uh, or, or, or going down the path of digital transformation. And of course, the second one, it should be obvious by now. I mean, we've been through a workshop yesterday where this came up, many of the talks and the keynotes this morning actually touched upon this. You know, it's about business transformation. It's, it's certainly important to have network transformation and other technology transformations, but this is really about business transformation over the long term. And then the third one is, is it wasn't so obvious when we started, but it's certainly something that a lot of organizations are talking about now, and that is the goal is to sort of make IT go from 8 to 5 to 724. I thought it was really an interesting observation that one person made who shared that, that, that notion so that we could actually think about what, you know, how do we actually bring together IT and operations and the network people and, the, and software people into, into a different kind of organization that is going to have to be blended and it's going to have to be uh, massaged into the culture the organizational objectives, and how those larger organizations are running. And then finally, I want to just put some of these thoughts together, so we have at least a minute for questions, um, to, to take a revamping and a relook at the state of open networking, only this time from a human perspective. Now, if we think about some of the key initiatives that organizations were talking about, even back in the 2013-14 timeframe, where we were getting exposure to new concepts like DevOps, open source platforms, and I'm not just talking about components, but open source platforms. As, if we think about it through the lens of the human beings and how they've interacted and how they were affected by just some of this, the, the first level initiatives, these are really ambitious. These are really difficult to execute on. And then if we go down and start talking about closed loop and we start to get into how do we achieve agility, you know, these require a very different way of thinking about everything that we do in an organization. And then finally, when we get to transformation, you know, it, it's really hard to completely disrupt the organization. So the way in which many organizations approach this is through incremental disruption. And that's an actual what we're seeing. So when we do an assessment of where we are in the state of open networking through the human lens, we're for the first set, for DevOps open plat well, platforms to a certain extent, they're not necessarily open, you know, we're proceeding cautiously along the path. I mean, how many organizations are completely DevOps driven like a, a hyperscale operator and who are also not completely cloud, I mean, not DevOps driven, but they're certainly closer. You know, we're proceeding cautiously along, those, the, 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 uh, along that path. And if we go to the next phase, closed loop, I mean, this is somewhat inherently incompatible with an operator's need or demand or desire for control. It's not something they're going to give away necessarily that easy. And the operators that uh, certainly I talk to and some of the operators that were contributing to this, to this set of work are certainly not willing to just automate to the point where there's no human beings in the loop and they don't have control of their primary asset, which, which is even more important than for an enterprise, for instance, because the, and the, the network is the business in the terms of telecommunications. And then finally... If we think about transformation, are we, 
are we throwing in the towel? No, we're not throwing in the towel. It's going to take time. It's going to take more years. It's going to take more work. It's going to take more iteration. And, it's the, and, and the end is, is beginning to be in sight. It's starting to come into focus as what the benefits are. And because of the fact that we can now look at what a lot of the cloud operators are doing and what uh, all the related activities that are ongoing in the industry that are actually spawning from cloud meets telecom, we're starting to get a much better perspective on this. So I think we're approaching the end, but if we have a question, I think we, can, we have time to take one. And, it's, and again, it's always hard to be the, the person between the drinks and the, uh, the end of the presentation. So I want to thank you again for the opportunity. I'm going to make the material, of course, uh, available through the uh, Layer 1, 2, 3 organization. And, um, and, have, and, and join us for the reception. Thank you. And finally, I just want to give some acknowledgments. These are the individuals who actually contributed. There should be some familiar names because these were some of the, literally the pioneers of the industry. What I wanted to do also is to just show you where they fit in the overall organizations. I didn't map people directly and I wanted to just respect that. But we're talking about the, the, some of the key leaders of these, these open source projects the key new generation standards like ONF and Etsy NFE, as well as other organizations that are actually starting to are continuing to gain momentum in the market today. So, all right, thank you, Mark. Right. Appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. You can have this.